Apple, I guess, and the um, double espresso with a Scottish accent. I use this light to start with when I travel um, because I've been in venues and I've seen people staring at me trying to work out what has been said. But, hi, I don't have to apologize in the land of big funny accents. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about today is um, it's a research paper it's a report, but I, want, I prefer to call it a magazine, and it's been designed as a magazine because I think the subject matter is fascinating and interesting and something we all have to pay attention to. So this is a, a, both a, a print magazine and a digital magazine. It's available in Australia through Hayworth, so they're their partners um, through Australia. And if you don't turn your telephones off, you will give yourself away as to your generation by the quality of your ringtone or your choice of ringtone. What I'm talking about is I actually think we're, we're in a very wonderfully interesting time. And what this is about, I, I, I don't like the idea of talking about research. I don't like the idea of talking about a report. Um, I think it's more about drawing a map. And you all know very well, if you have a map, if you're out hill walking or you're in a new city, whether you've got an, an ordnance survey map when you're out hill walking, or a, a, a map on your, your, a digital map on your telephone. It's invaluable information. And what I'm talking about, the research that we've conducted, is actually trying to redefine, redraw the landscape that we are all living in, we are all operating in. Because if we don't, we're going to screw up. And the reason we're going to screw up is because I think we're moving into a perfect storm. And the perfect storm is a, the constituents of the perfect storm is the virtualization of technology, um, boomers and kippers, which, and th these are the themes I'll pick up on through this talk, and the consumerization of technology. Now, what you're seeing on the screen, I'm a boomer, huh? And I can't remember half of what I'm supposed to say. So what's coming up on the screen, please feel free to read it because I, I am not going to remember to say it all to you. But this, this is a wonderful, this is from the technology guru at Microsoft, it's important that all of us do precisely what our competitors and customers will ultimately do. Close our eyes and form a realistic picture of what a post-PC world might actually look like. And this is terrorizing because the PC, the fixed desk, the tethered desk has held sway within the office for a very long period of time. And there's a big change, there's a perfect storm coming and we ain't seeing it very well. And the reason we're, we, d we, d we don't see it very well is what I'm about to touch on, but the, the reason we're talking about boomers and millennials is to get some clarity into it. We all know the idea of the four generations within the workplace, but we've actually caused, we've cut out a whole generation. I've happily offended a whole generation to get some clarity between the boomers and millennials. They're the two bookend generations of the workplace, and demographically, they're the most important. And you'll see from these slides, more so for us than for you guys, because you are much better placed than we are. But if you go through the generational numbers between the UK, Europe, and China, you get scared. You get scared big time. Even, even the states against China, those numbers are terrifying. The greatest danger in times of turbulence, it's not the turbulence, it's to act with Yesterby's logic. Peter Drucker said that, wonderful, brilliant business guru, I'm sure you all know, and I think he even said that in the 70s. Brilliant observation, this is a nice example of it. <coughs> this is a boomer behaving with classic boomer behavior. And this is, a, you know, this story broke towards the end of last year. Now this is a, a very powerful man, and he believes by taking his shirt off and showing his boomer body, he will inspire generations below him to act. How stupid is that? How stupid is that? And you would think he would have a good wife who had the sense to say to him, look, do it, you know, ride the horse and shoot the rabbits, but put a t-shirt on, put a cool t-shirt on. No. And I'll tell you why it's painful. This is another version. This is, this is a millennial version. The top left corner in Moscow, if you're in a position of, if you were in a position of power, you had a blue siren that you could put on the top of your car, and there were lanes that you could access that no one else could access. And everyone, all the boomers in a position of power, used the blue siren 
to go for the pizza, to take the child to the kindergarten, to go to the football match. And it got so abusive, it became really offensive. And what's wonderful about it, the millennial response to that was not violence in the streets. They founded something called the Blue Bucket Movement. And the Blue Bucket Movement started digitally. It, it happened collectively in the digital world, and then it went physical. So there was demonstration after demonstration of millennials walking about Moscow en masse with blue buckets, either on their head, strapped to their bicycle helmet, or strapped to their car. And the first wave of response was that the police were arresting everyone with blue buckets. Now, what happened, and, and this, this, is, this is the moral of the whole story, in a sense, of my presentation, is that stopped, and it stopped like that, because the millennial generation dropped the pants of the guys in the position of power. They thought they could terrorize, and through charm, they changed the agenda. That's the world that we live in. And if we don't pay attention to that, the wonderful potential of our new world is not going to be realized, because generally we all know, people in power generally are the boomers, and the boomers have to wake up, because we're in a wonderful period of change, and th this is a, a, a wonderful quote from the New York Times, a trend which represents a significant shift from the last few decades when the most advanced technologies were first available in the workplace and eventually migrated into consumer products. So, so, and I, I love this. Society will keep evolving under its own power, but a thoughtful strategy to derive strength from diversity takes conscious effort. And this is a punchline. You can't stop this train, but you can certainly miss it. And missing trains is really, really easy to do, much easier to do than we all might think. Take a great company like Kodak, which filed for bankruptcy a few weeks ago. How is it possible for a company as majestic as Kodak, who were masters of the universe of photography for decades, not to see that their world was going to change from that to that? Think of all those amazing corporate offices, all those wonderful big teak boardroom tables, all of those beautifully comfortable leather chairs. And they missed that train. My suggestion is missing trains, as we miss trains month after month, is much easier than we all might want to think. You know, and I've put answer in there. Just, you know, I know that that's still bubbling away, the whole scenario of that. But we all miss trains. And if we think we're masters of the universe and we don't miss trains, we're dreaming. I just want to context this a little bit because I'm describing a world that's in a state of flux and, and quick change. But what I'd want to suggest to you is that society has always been in quick change in a state of flux. And just take planes, trains, and automobiles. I'm a boomer, and 33 years ago, I, it's like last month, you know, I can remember where I went on holiday 30 years ago. Mankind first got an airplane into the sky and flew the Wright brothers 120 feet. What an, an, an unbelievable achievement. And the Wright brothers were the jobs and the Zuberger of their day, and they, they were chastised for being so stupid. Why do you want to do that? Why, why would mankind want to fly us? 33 years later, the Spitfire is flying at 350 miles an hour. Well, one of the best airplanes ever, ever, ever made. And if you've got a lot of money now and you can fly and you want to buy a Spitfire. Wow, 33 years. And that was achieved from first getting balsa wood <laughs> and fabric into the air to a majestic machine like that. Great trains, the same. You know, the first rail track was up and running in the US in the 1830s. And within 50 years, 95,000 miles of railway were in operation. That's not just, that's not just a one train. That's a whole network over a vast continent. You know, platforms, timetables, people commuting. What an amazing achievement. And, and the same with cars. You know, the first motor car was sold in 1896. And just 30 years later, Ford alone, Ford alone had sold the 15th million car. So just trains, planes, and automobiles, it seems to me that, you know, we've always gone through rapid change, rapid technology change and rapid culture change. So my big conundrum, and I'm a designer, I've been a designer all my life, is Society has always been changing quickly, so you'd think they'd be used to the idea by now, but we're not. We're shit at change. 
we're hopeless at change. We just resist change because it's, nat it's natural to our DNA. One, one big reason is this thing called the status quo. The status quo terrorizes us. I'll give you two wonderful examples. In England in 1722, we banned the import of cotton for 60 years. We rioted in the streets. We attacked people for wearing cotton. Ha! Cotton! Ah, oh God! <laughs> we had to pass an act of parliament to stop violence of people seen wearing cotton garments. Bananas, bananas. And it's even more bananas. Manchester was first known as Cotton Polis because Manchester was the city that grew, that changed our whole economy from agriculture to industrial through the processing of cotton. It made us wealthy, fundamentally changed society. And yet our first response to it was to get the fuck out. <laughs> and fast forward to last year, Paris. Paris was the first city to introduce bicycle hire, which you've now got in Melbourne as well, it's in 20 cities worldwide. They actually started electronic cars, electric car sharing, which went live last December. And the first response from the Taxi Drivers Union of Paris was, get this out! You're going to destroy our livelihood. You're going to kill our business. What, what are we supposed to do, sit at home? And we all know that we have to find intelligent solutions for the congestion that all cities suffer from. And yet, the status quo was such that we wanted to try to prevent this happening. How bananas is that? Plus the shock of the new. You know, we don't do the shock of the new very, very well. We all know about the history of art. We know about the shock of the new and history of art. But it's absolutely the same. Every, every part of our culture suffers from the shock of the new. The Aeron chair, which you all know, one of the most iconic products in the history of office furniture. When the Aeron chair was first presented, the response to the Aeron chair was dire. If you read the reports, it's, I, I recommend it, it's fascinating reading. It's ugly, it's stupid, why would you do that? Where's the upholstery? You know what? Bring it back when it's finished, and then we'll continue the discussion. But Herman Miller stuck to their guns, probably because they had invested so much money, but they stuck to their guns and they said no. And hi, it's revolution. You know, everyone has their Aeron chair. Completely revolutionized the way chair technology evolved into the workplace. Let's not get complacent. The iPad is the same. You know, the iPad was previewed in January. It went on release in April. In the blog sphere for this couple of months, there was a lot of great comments going around saying really dumb things like, the consensus seems to be that there really isn't much market out there for a tablet computer. And I'm, I'm a geek, you know, I'm on the inside. I'm giving you <laughs> some information here. And this is, this is, this is brilliant. This is a wonderful observation. It's a nice reader, but there's nothing on the iPad I look at and say, ah, I wish Microsoft had done that. Bill Gates said that. <laughs> you know, let's, so let's, let's not dare think we're masters of the universe. And this, this is interesting as well. We don't see the future very well. We just don't see it. You know, Blade Runner, one of the best movies ever, which I love, by one of the best directors, still at his top of his game. He did, Blade Run he did Blade Runner in the early 80s, and he chose to have the opening credit, Los Angeles 2019. Because he believed Los Angeles, in a couple of years' time, would look like this. He could have chosen any day. He could have chosen any day. But in the early 80s, he had the security to think, yeah, it's going to shape up. Yes, we'll be far away from that. We're disastrous at predicting the future. We might kid on that 